Hey guys and Geigers, I spent the first year working on mostly sharing manga videos and this time I wanted to get more into the monster side of things because if you read my descriptions, I'm mostly focused on monsters in manga, but uh, most of what you've seen here is a lot of discussion of Showa era manga, retro stuff, rare stuff, vintage stuff which totally cool. I'm into that kind of thing. And I do happen to have focused on a lot of comics that I purchased for my research. Uh, so you've already seen stuff for Oni, you've seen stuff for Mermaid, Farnigo and such. So uh, uh, just a little bit of background of why would I use the word Gaijin in my name? when it can be considered kind of a slur. And um, the fact is that there is a method to my madness. There is uh, some logic to it, a uh, warped logic, though it may be. Uh, it is my own logic, and uh, I take full responsibility for it. Uh, basically, um, the gaijin part of the word is uh, outsider. Not so much foreigner, but outsider, which is what uh, I've always considered myself, even when I was back in my native country, um, I kind of learned to enjoy the position of being outside looking in. Uh, sometimes I've been in uh, and uh, other times I've been out. And I think being out looking in has given me the best perspective on how to judge uh, the things in my life, the places where I am, etc. cetera. Um, this kind of outsider perspective, I got a little bit more uh, inspiration uh, when I read uh, Kurt Vonnegut Jr.'s Slaughterhouse-Five and... Uh, William S. Burroughs' Naked Lunch. They're both uh, white men, older men, who could easily fit on the inside if they had to, but felt more comfortable uh, on the outside, had more perspective on the outside. Something in their past kind of pushed them to the outside. Um, and Reading those books really gave me some extra perspective on uh, uh, on how to look at <laughs> the systems that are at work within the societies that I'm involved in, have lived in, et cetera. Uh, you know, the positive systems and the negative ones. So the the second half of the name is actually not just guy, it's jingai. And jingai means non-human. In other words, monsters. So this whole focus has uh, of this channel is actually outsiders and monsters. And, you know, that you could say that it's an oxymoron, that monsters are, by definition, you know, going to be on the outside. And yeah, that's true. But I also want to focus sometimes on just what's called outsider theory. So that's down the line. Uh, my research has mostly been in monsters and today that's what I'm gonna talk about. Uh, just a quick introduction to a series of videos based on the lecture that I gave two years ago at the, uh, the big manga academic uh, conference that happens every year. Um, I don't know, I'm looking over there. <laughs> just kind of focusing. Uh, so, uh, this particular presentation, uh, is written in Japanese, but, uh, I will explain everything, uh, as well as I can in English, um, skip over some of the less interesting parts and jump right into what monster theory is. So that's what today's video is, is talking about monster theory. So, uh, this particular presentation is called uh, Oni Representations in Promised Neverland 
and Kimetsu no Yaiba, you know, Demon Slayer, from a monster theory perspective. And I have got a, a lot of different topics uh, within the whole series, but today uh, we're going to very quickly just go through uh, a quick history or of how monster studies has evolved. Um, originally, the the idea of the monster came about at the same time that civilization uh, reared its somewhat ordered head uh, in the world. Uh, so as, as long as we've had civilizations, we've had boundaries and things that we don't want to come in. And those are the, the chaotic, the, the, the evil, the unordered, the disorderly, the, you know, the wild, the, uh, you know, the animal, the beastly, the monstrous. And so civilization builds, builds this wall and the things outside of the wall, they are the monsters and the people that we don't want inside are the, the ones who break the taboos, like, uh, eating people. So, cause that's bad. And, uh, people that don't, uh, follow rules that are chaotic, that are, are more about destruction than creation, uh, things considered dangerous and, you know, look large and scary. Uh, so look dangerous even, uh, the early monster stories were like a huge scale, um, you know, gods versus gods. Um, and then that went on, you know, you'd have monsters within folk tales and, uh, even in histories, you'd have monsters appearing in written histories and of course art. Uh, here's an example of a big ass cyclops. And then, uh, as civilization progressed and a society became more stratified and you have more rules and more nuances. Then the monsters themselves became a little bit more nuanced. And there were groups within the society that, uh, other groups wanted to push out. And so they kind of monsterized them, uh, by their differences, whether they look different or they had uh, different customs, you know, things that they did, uh, and then you also had people who traveled to other places and were basically, they were looking for monsters. They were expecting monsters. And so they found them, I suppose, because there's all kinds of, uh, bestiaries and such where they, they, uh, talk about all these monsters that they saw in these other countries. And so it's very easy to monsterize, uh, people of other cultures. I guess they see one thing and they thought, oh my God, that's that's a dog boy or something like that. So, uh, you see these kind of things in, in literature in you know, uh, charts and maps, uh, you have like, uh, uh, birth of, uh, children that are maybe don't have all their fingers or have an extra finger or something like this. And, uh, these were can called monstrous births, uh, and anything monstrous that like suddenly monstrous that suddenly appeared was considered some kind of portent, a warning. In, in fact, the word monster comes from the Latin, uh, monstare, which is like warning. Uh, and so of course, religion was involved. You have a lot of people wondering if these other creatures, they must be created by God. So do they have a soul? Can they be saved? Can they get, can they make it to heaven, et cetera? Uh, but what's more interesting for us is where monster studies evolves into monster theory, which is more internal, uh, more, you know, about the isms in the world, the racism, the sexism, the classism, the uh, Orient Orientalism, uh, you know, colonialism, etc. Um, and so that's when instead of people that are monstrous that you want to kick out, uh, you have the monstrosity inside the individual. So, uh, that part of them that we want to excise to exercise, uh, but, uh, the part that never quite can get be, uh, 
excised, actually. So identity, uh, et cetera. We have uh, psychology and philosophy and, and media studies that fall into this kind of category. Let's uh, move quickly along. Um, in, in Japan, you have a similar kind of progression. You know, you have, of course, uh, the original stories, which were um, gods versus gods. The scale was very big. Whole continents were being created and destroyed, etc. And then you have it getting more local to more like local provinces where you have uh, yokai, which are more on like a... Uh, hero versus monster kind of stories uh and then it became more like a a very daily close thing like in my town you had people warning their kids don't stay in the river too long or the cop are gonna get you they're gonna get you so you know you have to uh you have to get out of the water after a little while and i, I talked to some parents they said because their kids would never get out of the water uh, so they would, they would use that. Um, and then more in modern days, like the, the tale is not the legends or the, the folk tales. It's, it's the comics where, uh, these kind of stories still exist, you know? Uh, and it's more like part of the culture. And even though I'm saying the culture, because the TV media is pretty nationalized, there are local shows but um but personally i believe there's not one japanese culture it's actually an amalgam of hundreds of local cultures and they're all have they all have uh very distinct differences so i'm gonna move on from that and anyway yokai became more of a closer more of a cute thing a character thing a thing to collect if you think of pokemon it's kind of in that area uh, so, uh, you know, I think to, to know about and be familiar with and, and kind of, uh, feel like Gegege no Kitaro, you have Neko Musume here pictured from that series. There's, you know, there were several different booms of popularity of, uh, of these yokai. So, uh, and it keeps going, you know, it keeps going, it keeps, you know, growing every time so very tied in to modern culture leave this is okay this is tori kiyonaga that's not right kiyo something kiyonobu all right uh and you have the the hero defeating the devil uh in this picture uh so now let's jump to a little bit more modern time and talk about monster theory so jeffrey jerome cohen uh coined uh the phrase monster theory in this book that he edited that came out in 1996 uh he wrote an essay which is very formative still used in you know, I constantly refer to it. Lots of papers even published this year <laughs> refer to his essay, Monster Culture, The Seven Theses. And that's what this video series, we're going to go over the seven theses. And I'm, I'm probably going to break the videos up so that we talk about one thesis at a time. And so this video uh, hopefully will be the longest. And then the other ones will be more, a little bit more short. This is the introduction. Um, monster theory is a kind of literary theory. Literary theory is different than literary criticism. Uh, it's analysis. It's finding different ways to read text. And by text, I mean video, comics, whatever, books, anything. Uh, and finding different ways to read them, it doesn't mean that this is how they should be interpreted. It means... Uh, you can look at this same story from this lens and you can gain some insight, uh, some knowledge, either into the world, into yourself, into the, the work itself. So there's some, something to be gained. There's something to be learned. And that's what monster theory asks. What can we learn from the monster? Um, 
And this is a quick overview. This is just, I'm going to give you the names. Uh, we're actually going to go into the details in each individual video. Uh, the first thesis is a thesis is the monster's body is a cultural body. Uh, and then the, the second, the monster always escapes uh, to return. Uh, the monster is the harbinger of category crisis. And I think this is like the, one of the keys and one of the most important, most interesting uh, thesis of the theses. Uh, the monster dwells at the gate of difference. The monster polices the border of the possible. That's number five. Number six is the fear of the monster is really a kind of desire. And I'll probably talk about uh, my own personal fetishes are concerning monsters. You guys can do with it what you will. Uh, and then the, the final thesis seven, the monster stands at the threshold of becoming. Very little has been done to expand these, but there has been some work done. So far, I've been how I've applied it to my own research. Uh, I haven't done much expansion of it, but maybe in the next phase of my research, uh, I'll be ready to do something like that. So, uh, yeah, so that's uh, the introduction. And then we'll get into the individual uh, theses in the next video. All right. Uh, thanks for joining me. And uh, it's good to be back, back in action. Uh, so I'll see you guys in the funny papers.